Greetings. It is the last moon before the winter solstice and the days grow longer yet again. Also known as an excellent time to make things to give people to help them stay warm over winter. And today I want to try to make a pair of socks based on sources from the socks found in Sholham. I know I've mentioned Sholham on this channel before. It is an archaeological site discovered in Sholham in the northern parts of Norway, dated to between 936 and 1023 AD, placing it square in the Viking Age. Whether it belonged to a Viking is still up for debate though, as experts argue that the skeleton is too slight of a build for a Norseman, but genetic material was also too deteriorated to identify a Y chromosome or any Sami markers. The past being the past though, it was at some point assumed to be a white Norsewoman because the lack of Sami markers were somehow more important than the lack of a Y chromosome. We can all agree that centering whiteness as the norm is problematic, right? Good. Hilde Thunem has compiled a magnificent source of socks and hose from the Norse areas during the Viking Age. And even among the scarce source material we have from the time, the Sholham socks are unusual. Most woven hose follow what we see further south in Europe and later in the medieval era, with things like a seam up the center back of the leg. Sholham ignores this entirely though, and instead puts the seam for the shaft of the sock on the front. They are also a lot shorter than other hose, being only as long as the shoes with leg wraps over top, whereas other hose may reach up above the knee. There is also a slight angle to the top and bottom cut, allowing for some of the fabric bias stretch benefits, but without wasting quite as much fabric. Attached to the shaft and heel is an eye-shaped toe piece with fold lines along the red edges. The deterioration of the pieces means we do not know whether the seam would run over or under the foot, although no other hose from around the same time have been discovered with the seam running on top so far. Still, these socks are a bit unusual anyway, so who knows? We start off with this narrow piece of hand-woven wool twill I bought from this lovely Danish lady at market this summer. She warned me that it frays easily, so we will have to be very careful with it. Look at this glorious hand-woven selvage edge though. Not a single frizzy machine-woven edge in sight. As the pieces seem to be symmetrical, it seems reasonable to me that people in history might have cut them on the fold to make that easier for themselves. So that is what I am attempting to do as well. There is absolutely no need for me to use my Iron Age reproduction sewing needle for this, but I have it, so... I start off by preparing my wool pieces. First I am pinning and stitching down one side of the eye-shaped toe with strong back stitches. I do think the original notes actually talked about running stitches for the seam on the Sholham socks, but I cannot bring myself to do it. After stitching the seam, I am folding each seam allowance down on either side to reduce bulk under the foot and overcasting it. The fraying seams should be safe with the overcasting, but it is certainly a look, and not one I am sure I am a fan of. After finishing our toe friend, we are moving on to the heel, which is very much getting the same backstitch treatment. This wool is a joy though. I don't know what it is, but I prefer my wool to retain a subtle scent of the sheep it came from. Not too intense, of course, but 
I really like it to have a little bit of it. Makes me feel grounded and connected to the earth it came from. After overcasting the heel as well, we must make the difficult decision of whether to place the seam on the toe piece above or underneath the foot. I don't really think there's a right answer to this. I'm going to go with underneath. If for no other reason, then it'll continue the heel seam all the way to the toe that way. Pinning was done, and we returned to our faithful backstitch for this last assembly. This really is a quick little project. And lastly, we overcast all our edges, including on top of our sock. It will be on the inside, no one will see it. It will be on the inside, no one... No one will see it. But the top of the sock, people might see that. We are folding that double for neatness. Good morning! It is the next morning and I finished overcasting all these seams, but <laughs> as expected, I really don't like this raw unfinished edge, even though it is overcast and should be theoretically safe, despite, you know, this being much flatter, this corner right here. So in the dark of the night last night, uh, when the light was trash, I cut out the rest of the wool and I made a new pair with, you know, taller uh, last because this was the rest of the wool and I wanted to utilize it as well as possible and well I like these much better because they look so much neater and are much more worthy of giving away I think at least but now we do have this section down here that is quite thick and might disturb someone if they are bothered by that kind of thing under their foot but what I think we would do before we call this a quit is I thought we would try to felt these a little bit. I will start with the first ones because they are now going to stay with me since I like these much better and I'm going to give this to my friend. Uh, but we start with these and I will see if I can felt down these raw edges so that they do not fray any further. And if that is successful and we manage to flatten seams a little bit, I might try to felt just this section right here and see if I can make it a bit denser but ultimately flatter and more comfortable to walk on. This will happen naturally as you wear these socks anyway because as someone who wears a lot of wool socks they do felt, felt underneath your soles anyway over time but let's try to speed up the process a tiny bit just to see if we can make these a little bit more comfortable from the get-go. To help me with the felting, I have a bucket of warm, soapy water. Do not be fooled though, the whole thing that makes felting work is the friction. Here I am just rubbing the socks against the palm of my hand because I do not want them to shrink. I just want the fibers to felt together a bit to avoid fraying. You could also use a washboard, but I do not have one, so elbow grease it is. After felting the seams, I am rinsing out the soap in some clean water and laying them out to dry on a clean towel.
Oh, and I almost forgot, since we are actually done with the socks after this stage, they're gonna dry right side out, not wrong side out. Fixed it. And there we have it, two pairs of socks inspired by the sock fragments found in Sholhamn, felted for seam protection and ready to help keep feet warm. I am... as is often the case when a garment is very simplistic in its construction, quite surprised at how well they actually fit my foot. The first pair fit me the best, and because I knew this, I cut the second pair a little longer, as my friend has slightly larger feet than me. Personally, I am not actually that bothered by seams running under my feet, so the added bulk doesn't really bother me. If anything, the biggest bulk is cleverly placed to hit the arch under the foot, where it is the least bothersome. The second pair is larger, and you can see how much looser it sits on my feet, especially around the heel. I hope they will fit the intended recipient. And Winter Solstice gifts must, of course, be wrapped in red. Until next time, I hope you stay warm.